It tells us that Sam sells guns to two types of consumers, but he cannot explicitly screen them to charge them different prices. So real fast, remember that if we could explicitly screen them, we would be engaging in price discrimination. That was when we had senior citizens and young kids coming to the movie theater and we literally checked their ID and charged them different prices because that checking of their ID was our way of explicitly screening them. Well, now we just know that there's two types of customers, one that really likes our product and one that kind of likes our product. So there's a high demand consumer and a low demand consumer. We can't explicitly screen them, so we need to build our bundles in order for them to screen themselves into their by buying the package that's right for them. So anytime you go to Sam's and you buy a huge bundle of something, you're probably the high demand consumer in that case. At the register, there may, there may be that same single pack of gum. Well, the low demand consumer is going to buy that single pack of gum opposed to going to the aisle and buying that huge uh, case of several packs of gum. So this is what uh, menu pricing is all about. We're going to design bundles and price those bundles accordingly in order to um, let the high demand consumer pick into his bundle and the low demand consumer will still buy the single pack or um, the smaller bundle. It tells us how much profit can Sam make by implementing optimal menu pricing. So we're just going to be finding his profit in this case, but it's a pretty long problem. There's a lot of math steps, so be careful. In all these problems, we're going to be doing participation constraints and selection constraints. So get used to those and recognizing those and knowing how to talk about them. Well, step one in this case is to find out who the high demand consumer is. Who likes the product more? Well, this first guy likes it. Every unit he um, consumes gives him 18 to the 0.5. Well, the next guy likes it 8 to the 0.5 for every one unit he cons consumes. So I like to pick the number one because it just makes it easiest. But what you want to do is just plug in a number to the value functions and figure out who gets the most value out of the product. Well, in this case, it's kind of uh, easy to see. The first guy gets 18 worth of value if we plug in just one unit. The second guy gets eight worth of value if we plug in just one unit. So the first guy, um, he's the high demand consumer. There's 10 of those guys. There's 25 low demand consumers. And that's V2. That's the second guy. So now that we've done that, step two is to write out our constraints. Well, again, like I said, we have a participation constraint and a selection constraint. The participation constraint in menu pricing is aimed at the low demander because the high demander, we're not concerned with him participating in buying our product. He loves our product. But the low demand guy, we want to convince him to buy just the smallest unit of our product. So we need to make the value he gets out of that product greater than or equal to the price he paid for it. Again, we're going to always set these equal because we assume if they are equal, he will in fact purchase it. But think about it as greater than or equal to. It'll help you really understand. Well, in this case, we can plug in his value function, which is 8Q2 to the 0.5. That must be, we're going to go ahead and set it equal to the price of that smaller package. So Q2, in this case, represents, just for um, simplicity's sake, let's say that single pack of gum, right? And then Q1 is going to represent that big box of a lot of packs of gum. So P2 represents the price of that single pack of gum or the small bundle. And P1, in this case, represents the price of that big box of gum, which is the big bundle. Well, now let's take a look at the selection constraint. This is aimed at the high demander because the participation constraint just convinced the low demander to buy that single pack of gum. Well, the selection constraint is going to convince that high demander to select between the low pack of gum and the big pack of gum. So the low bundle, the small bundle, and the big bundle, we're going to convince him to select the big bundle. We do this by making the value he gets out of purchasing the big bundle relative to the price greater than the value he gets out of purchasing the small bundle relative to the small bundle's price. So we can plug in our numbers here. Now be very careful to understand this. The value he gets is represented by that 18. The Q1 in this case is again that big box of gum. So if he buys that big box of gum on the, so on this side, we're saying if he buys this big box of gum at the price of that big box, we're gonna at least make it, again, think about it as greater than, but we're gonna set it equal to solve. We're gonna make it equal to if the same guy represented by the 18 were to buy the small pack of gum, 
which is the Q2, the small bundle, at the price of the small bundle. So we're gonna make the value he gets out of purchasing the big bundle greater than the value he gets out of purchasing the small bundle. Again, setting him equal to solve, but think about it as greater than. Step three is write out the profit for the firm. So profit, we need to um, kind of forget what we know about profit, profit as far as marginal cost times quantity and price times quantity and all that good stuff. Now we're just gonna think about what profit would be like for the firm. Well, remember there's 10 high demand consumers. What does the firm get out of them? Well, they charge them a price of P1 and it costs them, well, we know that the marginal cost is two per unit, two per pack of gum, $2. So on this side, we have the price for the big pack of gum minus the marginal cost times how many units Q1 was the big box. And then on this side, we have 25 low demanders. We're gonna be charging them a price for the small pack of gum, and they're gonna be getting, the, the mar they're gonna be costing the firm $2 per small pack of gum. So that's how we set up profit. Make sure that you're comfortable with this because from now on, we're gonna see profit in a couple of different ways. We have to be creative in um, thinking about it and just make it simple. So from here, we need to use our constraints, but we know that this is our first constraint, our participation constraint. This is our selection constraint. We need to be plugging into profit for P1 and P2. We need to have all Qs in profit because after all, when we maximize profit, we're gonna be trying to figure out or we're gonna be deciding how big Q1 is and how big Q2 is. Those are our two goals. So we need to substitute in something for P1 and P2. Well, we see P2 is easy. We have eight Q2 to the 0.5 that we can substitute in for that. P1 is, is not as simple. We need to first substitute P2 from the participation constraint into the selection constraint. After we've done that, we can solve for P1 in terms of just Q1s and Q2s. So we do that, we rearrange this, and we find that P1 is equal to 18 Q1 to the 0.5 minus 10 Q2 to the 0.5. We're now ready to substitute all of the, the, both of the P1 and the P2 into our profit function. Now that we've done this, we can take the derivative because we're gonna maximize profit with respect to both variables, Q1 and Q2. Well, first let's do it with respect to Q1, we'll get 90 Q1 to the 0.5 minus 20. Now, notice that what I did there is I distributed through that 10 times 18, which gave me 180. I multiplied it by the 0.5, which gave me that 90. And then I subtracted one from the exponent, which gave me that negative 0.5. I did the same thing. I multiplied the 10 through by the negative 2 Q1, and I got negative 20 Q1, took the derivative to get negative 20. Now I can solve for Q1. I first, again, you're setting it equal to zero, of course, and we know that in the future, I'm gonna do this as a shortcut, but first I wanna show you that that negative 0.5 could be a positive 0.5 on the bottom, so that Q1 raised to the negative 0.5 could be 90 over Q1 raised to the positive 0.5. I could then cross multiply and divide through by 20 and solve for Q1 and square it. And I get that Q1 is equal to 20.25. So now I can do the derivative with respect to Q2. I get, well now, be careful, there's not only a Q2s over on this side, but there's also a Q2 over here. So that first one, that'll be negative 100, because you have to distribute through that times 10. Negative 100 times 0.5 is negative 50. You make it negative, uh, raised to the negative 0.5 again, you drop one off the exponent. And the second part, well 25 times eight, that gives you 200 times 0.5, that'll give me that positive 100, and the negative two at the end there times 25, that gives me 50. So again, I set that equal to zero, and now I can combine like terms, and I solve for Q2 in this case to be equal to one. So real quick before we answer the question, let's take a look at what we did. We found Q1 and we found Q2. Well again, I wanted to draw you a little picture to make this easy to think about. Q1 represents that big box of gum with several packs of gum in it. Now I drew eight here, but just think about it. It's really 20.25. Well, Q2 represents that single pack of gum. To find the price of the, of the first package, we already found that through the constraint, we would just plug in Q1 everywhere we see it. 
and we'd have to plug in Q2 also. Notice that the, the big package's cost, or the big package's price, which is the cost of the consumer, that depends on the small package's quantity, which is important to understand. And the price for the smaller package, P2, we know that that just depends on the quantity of the smaller package, Q2. To find profit, we're going to plug Q1 and Q2 everywhere we see it in our profit function and solve. And in this question, that's all he asked us to do was to find the profit if we successfully engaged in menu pricing.